Hi, this is Annie Grace, and I am the author of This Naked Mind, Control Alcohol, and I'm here today answering readers' questions. Today, I have a question from Maria. She says, hi, Annie. I'm so excited about the possibilities in this course, the video course, um, that it has for me in my lifestyle. I'm a little into week two, which has taken me over four weeks, but you said it was great to go at my own pace. That's what I've been doing. I haven't yet changed my drinking habits, and I'm allowing myself to drink the same because the course says it's okay to until I feel ready to and I worry that I might not have it much longer. <clears throat> so far, I noticed that you talk about giving away your courage when you're out presenting at work or for parties, but my habits are drinking alone almost every evening until I either pass out or so that I can go to sleep more quickly. It just stops the chattering in my brain. Will this be covered? Because I know that my ability to knock back drinks every night means I miss the point of no return and I end up regretting things. Why have I built up such a tolerance and how can I get out of this cycle of drinking alone? So this is a great question. I think that idea of turning off the chatter in our brains. I mean, alcohol is is effective at a few things and that's one of the things it's effective at. You literally, alcohol makes your neurons like fire slower. So it increases GABA in your brain, which makes your brain process things slower and it increases glutamate. And these things end up making your thoughts slower. You also receive information from your senses at a slower rate. So if you're drinking to turn off the chattering in your brain, alcohol can do that. The problem is that it also increases other things like stress hormones, like adrenaline and cortisol. So for the very short moment, it's going to decrease the chattering in your brain, but then it's going to be replaced with, as your, as your body purges the alcohol, stress and anxiety. And these things are gonna be introduced in your brain from the alcohol. And then guess what happens? You want more alcohol to <laughs> decrease the chattering that's not coming from the cortisol and the adrenaline that has been released. So ultimately it's this cycle and it's a cycle that goes upward and upward and upward. I think the key here is to figure out how to be at peace with the chattering in your brain. And this is not something that I would say is easy, but it is simple and it's very, very, very worthwhile. And the, the crux of it is that, first of all, we have to recognize we all have it. We all have this freight train of chatter in our brain. And we have to understand that the majority of the thoughts we have today, we also had them yesterday. So this chatter is a habit and it's a deeply ingrained habit and even worse, is that for most people, the majority of the thoughts are negative. And so actually just becoming aware of that, that A, it's it's a habit, B, it's negative, and then guess what happens when you have this lots of negative thoughts going on in your brain, it triggers negative emotions because you start to believe these things. But if you're thinking them every single day and they're completely habitual in nature, they're not true. And so I think just saying, okay, wait a second, I don't have to believe every single thing I think. And I can slow down long enough to actually hear what I'm thinking. This was a big moment for me when I started saying, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to notice when I start to get anxious or upset, I've decided that I'm not going to nub it anymore. I'm not going to turn it off. The only way out of this is through. The only thing I can do to fix this is actually understand it and fix it. I'm not going to be able to like band-aid this up as with the band-aid of alcohol anymore because that's not an option for me. And so I started to say, okay, I my trigger would be I started to feel emotionally uncomfortable. And then as soon as I felt emotionally uncomfortable, I would say, okay, what was I just thinking? And I would try to backtrack to what I was just thinking. And almost inevitably, it was something that I felt like I'd done wrong, something that I felt like somebody else did wrong to me, something that I was disappointed in in my life. And it was some sort of negative talk. And it was most often negative talk to myself. And what I started to do is I started just writing it down. I just got pen and paper and I'd write down exactly what I was thinking. And the thing about that, that was a really big moment of awareness. And I say this a lot, but awareness is not always fun. In fact, it's very rarely fun, but it's always important. And it should always be celebrated because all change happens on the other side of awareness. But the awareness was that I wasn't nice to myself in my head. I was not saying nice things to myself. I wasn't even talking to myself on the same level level of niceness that I would talk to a stranger. I was more mean to myself than I would be to someone I didn't even know. Much less, you know, I strive now to talk to myself how I would talk to a child or how I would talk to someone I love or who I, who I care about. And that changing that pattern of what was I saying? What is this chatter actually saying? And is it true? And is it nice? Just let's treat myself with just a decent level of respect inside my brain. Changing that pattern changed 
everything for me. I mean, that was one of the main tools I used to get off 17 years of antidepressants. That was one of the main tools I used to just decrease my anxiety across the board. It's one of the main tools that I used to become a happier person. And I think that when we feel something we want to numb, if we can just remember, okay, whatever's happening right now that's making me feel uncomfortable, I actually need to press into this and get through it instead of just taking that quick fix of numbing it because that is never going to ultimately make it worse. It's kind of like when you're at the gym, right? And all of a sudden you say you get on the treadmill and your heart starts to beat faster at this, at the immediate discomfort, you know, your body's saying, Oh, I want to get off, off the treadmill. I don't want my heart to beat faster. But we know logically now we know that when our heart starts to beat faster, we push into that. We push into that discomfort because the, benefit and the reward is on the other side of that discomfort. And the same thing with solitude. We really have to allow ourselves to be in solitude, to listen to what our, that chatter is saying, to detangle that chatter and say, are these things really true? Because we all have chatter in our brains and it's just a habit. It really is just a habit. And the danger comes when we start believing these things because they're mostly habitual. They're almost always negative and they're just not good for us. But the thing about it is even if you turn it off with alcohol in the very short term, it's going to resurface overnight in your dreams the next morning when you're driving to school. But if you can say, I'm going to listen to this chatter and I'm going to take the steps to write down what I'm thinking and actually catch myself thinking negative things, change it, at least try to be nice to myself inside my own brain, then what happens is you don't have any chatter to turn off because ultimately you find a place where you're just sitting around in the evening and you're looking around and you're like, oh, it's kind of quiet in here. <laughs> I can't promise it will always be quiet, but I definitely notice times where I'm just being I'm like, wow, this is totally new. I'm just sitting here experiencing whatever it is I'm experiencing and I don't feel like I have to run away from myself anymore and I don't feel like I have to run away from my brain anymore. So that's that's just so important. And then the second part of that question was about sleep, that you just drink to fall asleep. And of course we know that sleep is just essential to our well-being. But I want to talk really quickly about alcohol and sleep. So there's two levels of sleep. We have deep sleep and then what's called slow wave wave sleep, that's REM sleep or rapid eye movement. So basically every night we go through cycles of both of those things. And REM sleep is where your eyes are literally going back and forth underneath your eyelids. That's where the name rapid eye movement comes from. And it's a lighter sleep, but it's really good for your health. And so we don't know why, but there was a study done. Rats were deprived of REM sleep and it actually killed the rats in a very short period of time. It's really scary. So you need to go in and out of that deeper slow wave sleep and that rapid eye movement sleep through a night. And this should happen six or seven times a night. But when alcohol comes into the equation, it's a chemical depressant. So it actually, like we just talked about in the beginning, it reduces your brain waves. It reduces your neural activity in your brain. So normally your brain is releasing this variety of chemicals and hormones at different times to like maintain this balance of sleep and to maintain homeostasis, this delicate balance in your brain. But when you drink, you introduce this foreign chemical. And so in order for your brain to maintain that homeostasis, it has to release these powerful counter chemicals or these stress hormones. So it looks like this. You have a drink, you stimulate your brain, your alcohol, blood alcohol is rising, but then your alcohol levels start to go down. Your brain knows there's a depressant in your system, so it actually releases stimulants. And again, this is the adrenaline and the cortisol. These bring you back into balance, but as the alcohol wears off before the stimulants do. So that means that you're trying to sleep. You can fall into a really deep sleep with alcohol, obviously. We can pass out. But then your brain releases these stimulants, this adrenaline, this cortisol. And so we eyes pop open. I remember this so vividly. Three in the morning, wide awake, heart beating fast, totally awake and wondering what was I doing. And by the way, beating myself up. And guess what? Those thoughts that we were talking about earlier incessant at three in the morning because then I'm beating myself up about all those bad decisions I made. And so you're left with this overstimulated brain for hours after your drinks have worn off. So it's like you're, you turn your brain way down, your brain counteracts, it turns it up, alcohol wears off, but these stimulants have not worn off as fast. And so the alcohol really disrupts your sleep schedule. So again, you drink, you go into this very deep sleep for the first four or five hours. It seems great, but you actually don't get REM sleep because you're in a deep sleep and your body needs both. Your body's trying to process the alcohol, so it turns on the stimulants and then boom, 
after four or five hours, you wake up and often can't even get back to sleep. And this is, I mean, so many people who drink heavily talk about this. You wake up four or five in the morning, you start to worry about everything, worry, regret, negative thoughts, all takes over and it's all happening because of the chemical that you initially drank. So in the moment, it's gonna feel like I'm numbing my loneliness, I'm numbing my thoughts, I'm numbing my brain, I'm helping myself fall asleep. But long-term, everything that happens chemically in your brain actually makes all of those things worse. And so the good news is that once you stop using alcohol to fall asleep, you get back on track. And if you're feeling like, I know I was very, um, just not my normal energy level. I didn't feel like I had a lot of energy over time. If you're feeling this way, and a lot of it has to do with just the very low quality of sleep that you're getting, once you stop doing that to yourself, and once you start to give yourself a few weeks to adjust back to normal and then start sleep normally, oh my gosh, it's like the lights have come on for the first time. The brain fog lifts. You're finally getting the cycles of the REM and the normal sleep that you need. And boom, all of a sudden your energy is through the roof and it's a phenomenal experience because you're just simply getting sleep when you weren't getting sleep before. And then you combine that with like really learning how to deal with your thoughts instead of having to turn them off, and your entire life can change. So it's an excellent, excellent question. Thank you so much, Maria, and have a great day.